Thanks. Folks are calling in. We're gonna we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I want to welcome everybody uh, this evening. I'm Aaron Shapiro, Executive Director of Patapsco Heritage Greenway. We're delighted to have you. Um, I, I guess on what is now probably the first summer day of the of the winter that we have. Um, but we're happy to, to have you come inside for a little bit um, to learn more about the Bloody Dam. So I'm going to turn it over. Um, to Kyla Cools, our Heritage Program Coordinator, who is going to introduce our speaker. Uh, well, there'll certainly be time uh, for questions at the end, and we'll talk a little bit more about some upcoming events we're having as well. Um, so I'll turn it over to Kyla. So thanks for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you. So hi, everybody. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Kyla Cools, and I'm the Heritage Program Coordinator for Tasco Heritage Greenway. I just want to thank you again for joining us today and welcome you all to our second talk of our 2024 Patapsco Day celebration. Our theme this year, National Themes and Local Stories, highlights manifestations of national phenomenon at the local level, emphasizing how local sites and history are embedded within a broader national context. Our speakers and events will explore various aspects of national history taking place within and around the Patapsco Valley Heritage Area. So joining us today, we have Jesse Thomas Blake, um, who is a director of River Restoration at American Rivers, which is an organization dedicated to the protection and restoration of rivers for people and nature. Based out of Alexandria, Virginia, Jesse focuses on river restoration, primarily through the practice of dam removal. She has been a restoration practitioner for 10 years, working throughout the Mid-Atlantic, including on the Patapsco River through the Bloody Dam Removal Project. So today, Jesse will be speaking about historic dams along the Patapsco and the removal of the Bloody Dam. She'll also uh, explore what kind of big picture results the Patapsco has seen since the removal of the dam. And so with that, please join me in welcoming Jesse Thomas Blake. Hello, thank you all for coming out. I appreciate you spending your time with me on this beautiful evening. I know you could have decided to be romping about outside, um, uh, I certainly wouldn't blame you, but I appreciate you taking time to come and listen and hear and, and talk with me about what we've been working on out on the Patapsco River to restore the river. Um, so, how many folks have been involved with Patapsco Heritage Greenway since before the dams on the Patapsco were removed? Hands? So a few of you. Fantastic. Um, some of this may be, uh, may be old news to some of you, but hopefully we'll have some new news as well. So I work for an organization called American Rivers. It's a national nonprofit organization dedicated to the protection and restoration of rivers across the country. I am based out of Alexandria, Virginia, but we have offices all over, you know, many places in the United States. Our headquarters is out of Washington, D.C. Um, and I work primarily on dam removal in the Mid-Atlantic region. And I've been doing that for 10 to 11 years now, um, since earlier in the Bloody Dam Removal Project process. Um, I wasn't the primary person that managed that project. Um, someone else who's, who's our national dam removal coordinator, Serena McLean, was the project manager for the projects that I'm going to be talking about today, and I assisted her through the process and am now sort of taking over our work on the Patapsco um, as things continue to evolve. So I'm not going to delve into a lot of the history on the Patapsco. I think you all probably have other Patapsco Days talks about this and your Patapsco Heritage Greenway, so many of you probably have like written books and things about the history of this area. Um, but as you probably know, the Patapsco has been a busy river for a very long time now. We've got a lot of different types of industry in the area on the Patapsco. You have issues with flooding in Ellicott City that impact the river. You have the mills, the historic mills that used to be in this area that are continuing to have some impacts on the river over time. You have Patapsco Valley State Park, Maryland's you know, most visited and beloved park with 2.65 million visitors annually. Um, so you have people coming, they need access to the river, they need access to the park, they're recreating in the area. Um, and 
there's rail running along the Patapsco that has been there for quite a long time as well. So there's a lot of things happening on the Patapsco. And then you had a number of dams uh, impacting the river as well. Um, and so when you have dams and you have fish, dams act sort of like a wall for fish. They stop fish from going upstream. It's sort of like if you're a person and you have you know, your blood running through the arteries in your body, when you put a dam in a river, it's like a blood clot in the river where the water and the nutrients can't move around the way that they should in order to have a healthy river. And so American Rivers worked with a number of folks, probably some of you in the room, as well as many others in this uh, Patapsco area to talk about removing some of the dams on the Patapsco. Um, and so that's what we embarked to do with this project. So there are four dams primarily that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, they, three of them are now gone. Um, so in the 2009 to 2011 time frame, the Union and Simpkins dams were removed. And then in the 2018 to 2019 time frame, the Bloody Dam was removed. And that had been the farthest downstream dam for a very long time. Now, the farthest downstream dam is the Daniels Dam. And I'm sure folks have thoughts and questions about that. We'll talk about that at the very end. Uh, but we're gonna focus mostly today on the removal of the Bloody Dam, uh, which happened uh, about five years ago now. The purpose of this, this project is first to protect the, or, or I'm sorry, restore and reconnect the river corridor for migratory fish, particularly American eel and alosines. Those are river herring and shad, migratory fish that are living out in the ocean but come up into the rivers to spawn. Um, and there is a big effort because the populations of those fish are depleted out in Chesapeake Bay and elsewhere along the Atlantic coast. Um, to try to get better access for them to their spawning habitats. So that was one of the drivers of this project. We also wanted to restore the aquatic habitat for the fish that live here all year round and the other aquatic insects and invertebrates and, and critters and so forth that use the river corridor. We wanted to eliminate the impoundments and restore riverine processes, including sediment transport through the system. And we also wanted to reduce water temperatures and increase dissolved oxygen levels. Um, some addition, additional objectives of this project, particularly as it relates to the Bloody Dam, it's like in particular, um, that project was also largely motivated by an interest in increasing public safety at the Bloody Dam site. Um, all of these dams are in Patapsco Valley State Park. They're all owned by the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. And there were people dying at Bloody Dam and they didn't want that to continue happening. It was a safety hazard. People would climb on the dam. They would not obey the signs that said, don't go onto this dam. Um, and people would slide off of it. There's like actual pictures of people sliding off of it. I won't judge you if you decide to slide off of it at some point. Um, though fortunately, it's not, it's not out there anymore um, for people to get injured on. Um, and that was a, another driver of that particular part of the project. So given that you're Patapsco Heritage Greenway, I thought you would like to hear some about the historical documentation that we did along with the removal of Bloody Dam. Um, it, you might not know this, um, or you might, but when you do a project like this, you have to, because of state and federal laws, um, you have to look at the historic nature of a site if you're going to do something like remove a dam. And you need to take a look at what the impacts of removing that dam might be on the historic resources. And if you, there is expected impacts on historic resources, then you're required to do something to mitigate that and take steps, actions, which I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you about here um, that we took at this site, in order to sort of um, make sure that you're properly documenting the site and that people in the future will be able to experience in some way what was here and why it was important. So this is happening under the National Historic Preservation Act, Section 106. 
Um, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration was the lead federal agency in this process. Um, the project was funded with a combination, the Bloody Dam Removal Project was funded with a combination mm -hmm. of state and federal and private funds. Um, you'll see some of those funders at the end of the presentation. Um, but because there was federal money involved with this project, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, was involved, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service was involved, and of course a number of state agencies and other partners were involved as well. So, the National Park Service um, was contracted through their Heritage Documentation Program to do historical documentation for the Bloody Dam Removal Project. And that involved a number of different pieces that came together in the end to sort of be the historical documentation of the Bloody Dam structure. Bloody Dam was a unique structure um, in that it was a one-of-a-kind sort of type of hydropower. The designer of the project was Victor Bloody, and he designed this dam. He lived in this area. He was an industrial person. Um, he was the person who invented the adhesive on stamps, um, but he also did other, other things. Um, and one of those things was creating the design for this dam. But it was an internal um, hydropower dam, and the Patapsco River moves a lot of sediment. And so they didn't realize when they designed this dam that the sediment was going to clog up the operations in the dam. And so it just didn't really work. So the dam was in operation for a decade or so, um, but it just wasn't functional. And eventually they ended up closing down the hydropower operations at the dam. And it just sort of hung out there um, for many years after that until you know people came along and removed it. So this, if you haven't actually seen the inside of the Bloody Dam, it was possible to walk through it where the turbines used to be. None of the equipment was there anymore. Uh, but some people did sneak in. Obviously, there's a lot of tags that were inside of the dam graffiti tags. Uh, but you can see some of, through some of these pictures taken by Gerald Ortiz with the National Park Service um, that it, it was a, 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 a sort of secret little place within the park um, but you can also see some of the sediment that had gathered inside of the dam in those pictures on the right hand side. Um, it didn't, if, if it um, hadn't been full, the, the level of the sort of bottom of the, the, where the dirt is would be much lower. Um, but a lot of that had, had filled in over time. Um, so they did a beautiful set of photography um, through the National Park Service of the dam. They also wrote a report, a historical report, that talks about the history of industry in the area and of milling in the area. It talks about Victor Bloody and the different things that he did. It talks about the design of this particular dam. Um, it kind of walks through that. So there's a historical report. And they also brought out surveyors and did a design plan set. So it's, a, it's basically like an as-built design plan set of what the dam looked like before it was removed. So they went out and did special scans of everything, um, and they, through that, they were able to create, basically create engineering plans for the dam based on what was there um, shortly before it was removed. Um, so that exists. This is a, um, and hopefully this works, um, a, fly through animation that the Park Service did of the dam. So if you get motion sick, maybe don't watch this part. It's a little <coughs> woo, but um, I'm not gonna show you the entire thing. I'm just gonna show you a clip that I took out of the inside of the dam, because that's the part that people can't, you know, probably haven't seen. Ooh, it didn't work. Um, all right, maybe we can play it straight from the um, it's, I might just have to play it straight from the file. Sorry. Just give me one second. Where's the file? You have to sit on the low. You just need to be on the top. Pardon me, I said you just need to be on the top. 
outside of the dam when the water was lower. Um, there's obviously tons of graffiti inside of the dam through on all the ceilings and the walls, um, quite a lot. So people were in there even if nobody um, realized that as much. Um, but the different parts of the dam as they go along are a little bit um, a little bit different. Some of them have those, those circular holes and, and other parts don't. There were stairs that went into the dam, um, so you could climb out either side of it um, from the inside. And then this goes, pops out to the outside of the dam, and that's it. Um, there's more to that if you want to check out the outside of it as well. Um, I do have, um, we're going to put this, the, the Maryland Department of Natural Resources was going to put this on their website. I don't know if it ended up in a visitor center, um, but we are going to put this up on YouTube and have it on our website. So we should soon have a link to the, the fly through animation and complete if you're interested in watching the whole thing. Um, it's pretty cool. Um, there we go. Okay. So another thing that the Park Service worked with us on was developing a set of interpretive signs. So if you've been out to the park since this project was completed, then you've probably seen some overlooks out there that have interpretive signage. These are the signs that were developed as part of that. So there's two on each side of the river where the former dam is and the overlooks that are there. There's one that shows kind of some of the interior and design sort of set of what the dam had originally sort of been envisioned to look like with the turbines inside of it and so forth. There's one that talks about the industrial history of Catonsville. There's one that talks about the ecological benefits of the project. And then there's one that talks about Victor Bloney and just his own personal history. So the places that look like this are the overlooks where the signs are. Um, they're right there off the personal trail and then off the trail on the other <coughs> side. Um, if you want to go see those in person sometime. So all of the information, the historical imagery and so forth were things that the National Park Service collected as part of their historical documentation of the project. And then they added all of this stuff, with possibly the exception of the fly-through animation. I'm not sure that that's in the Library of Congress, but their report, their photos, um, their design drawings that they did, all of that information is in the Library of Congress. So if you want to go and see any of that and dig into it yourself, you're welcome to do that. Um, it's up on their website. I pulled this off. Um, that's the address, but you can also just search up Lodi Dam and it'll come up. So I want to talk now, switch a little bit out of the history and talk a little bit about the project itself and what we did out there and some of the results that we've seen through our monitoring program. So the design for this project started basically following the removal of Simpkins Dam. It kind of rolled right in to the Bloody Dam removal project and they started working on the design for that. The construction timeline ran from 2017 to 2019, but the dam itself was removed in September of 2018. 
So there was a lot of work that had to happen at the site before the dam was removed, and that was mostly focused on moving a sewer line in the river. The project also involved the removal of the dam, obviously, and then some additional site restoration. So the first step of the project was moving the sewer line. If you, were, if you had been out there and had seen the dam, there was a sewer line literally running through the dam itself. That sewer line had to be moved back under Gristmill Trail. So if you go out there now, the sewer line is under Gristmill Trail. You can't see it. Um, nobody probably knows it's there unless you know about this. Um, or you're looking very closely at where the sewer line's going in the upstream and downstream area. Um, if we hadn't moved it, it would have been suspended in midair uh, when the dam was removed because it was at an elevation that was like 30 feet up. And when the dam came out and the sediment moved out from behind it, the sewer line would have just been there, which obviously is not a safe uh, condition for it to be in. So it had to be lowered and pushed back out of the riverway to ultimately reduce the chances that it gets damaged in a, in a flood or, or other event you know, down the road. Um, so that was a very complicated part of the project. It was also an expensive part of the project. And it took a lot of time to move that sewer line. As part of the sewer line part of the project, um, in the middle picture here, you can see this historic wall. That wall is in the upstream end of the impoundment near that pedestrian bridge. That wall was tagged. Each of the, the bricks along that wall were tagged in a way that they could take that wall apart, do the sewer line work they needed to do, and then put it back in the same configuration as they took it out. And that was something that was agreed to as part of the Section 106 um, historical mitigation for the project was the concern over this historic wall, moving it away, and then putting it back as close as possible to what it looked like previously. Then we came to the dam removal. Um, the dam was breached in September of 2018. It was breached with a blast with explosives. Um, and then excavators came in and removed a lot of the rest of the structure of the dam. And then there was, I think, two follow-up blasts to get the foundation of the dam out. Um, it had been fortified over the years with a lot of extra concrete. Um, so it was a challenge to get all of that out. But one of the reasons that they used explosives to breach the dam is that it runs very quickly through that part of the Patapsco River. The river runs just very quickly. So for safety purposes for the crews that were working on the project, it made the most sense to try to get things to drain down as quickly as possible. Then there was a site restoration aspect. So once the sewer line was moved, the dam was out, Gristmill Trail was put back in place, and the overlooks were installed. There was a lot of trees that were planted. If you've been out there now, like everything, well, at least once the spring, you know, the leaves come out in the spring, everything will be green, green, green everywhere. Um, but at the time, you know, it was just a matter of trying to get some of the basic pieces back together and get the site a little bit stabilized. We had some permit obligations um, that were part of the project specified by, by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Um, they required us to monitor for a minimum of five years um, for changes in the physical, so like the sediment movement in the system, looking also at the, the little critters, the macro benthic or benthic invertebrates, the different types of fish in the river, taking photos, looking at water quality, um, making sure that the project was going forth as planned. <coughs> And there was also a adaptive management plan that was developed that largely hasn't had to be used because the project has largely gone as it was planned, which is great. Um, so, but it's important to have that anyway, just in case something were to have gone a little bit sideways. Um, so the Maryland Biological Stream Survey has been monitoring the Patapsco River since 2009. Every year they go out there and do an anadromous fish survey. Anadromous fish are the, the species that live out in the ocean and migrate up the rivers to spawn. Um, those types of fish like shad and river herring. An American eel survey 
Okay, eels live in the river for a lot of their life cycle, but they spawn in the ocean, so they're sort of opposite um, in their life history. The resident fish of the area, and then a benthic macroinvertebrate survey. I'm going to talk today mostly about the anadromous fish and American eel survey results, but if you're interested in hearing more about the resident fish and the benthic macroinvertebrates, I'm happy to share information with you later on if you reach out. So one of the big questions that people tend to ask is, did the migratory fish come back? We took these dams out, have the fish returned? So the Maryland Biological Stream Survey has been going out there every year and conducting 50 to 55 sampling events where they've collected more than 30 species of fish. Seven of those migratory species have been observed above the former Bloaty Dam. That includes three alewife and one blueback herring that were captured at or above Ilchester Road at the top of the impoundment. They're going to be going out for likely the last time this spring. So, you know, within like now, basically starting now, um, in order to see if we're catching more fish. So some of what we're basically seeing is that the fish are starting to move upstream and access that upstream habitat, but it will take time for the, the fish to, to really come back in bigger numbers. It also depends a bit on how the population is doing across the Atlantic coast. Um, so it's not just what's happening in this river, but hopefully opening this habitat will help support the population of these different fish species. The Smithsonian Environmental Research Center, or CERC, has also been doing some research on these fish. They've been looking at what's called environmental DNA. So people have DNA, and when you look at it, you can tell it's from a human. Fish have DNA, and different species of fish have DNA you can identify as a different species of fish based on certain characteristics. So if you have a collection of water that you've done in the river, and you look at it, you can see, is there, is there DNA from a river herring in this water sample. And so the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center has been looking at that out in the Patapsco at a number of different sites. They determined that the likelihood of detecting alewife and blueback herring DNA above the former Bloaty Dam has increased. Uh, they actually detected environmental DNA for blueback herring above Daniels Dam in 2021. So that could be there from maybe a bird eating a herring and dropping it up above the Daniels Dam, something like that. Um, I don't think probably they're able to use the fish ladder. The fish ladder up there is not really in good shape. So it's probably getting up there through some other means. Um, they've also been looking at spawning activity and evidence of eggs in the river. They haven't seen evidence of spawning yet. They are also gonna be going out this spring and hopefully we'll see some evidence of spawning out in the river. So they're also looking at American eel, and they've been electrofishing out there at 17 sites each summer, plus the Daniels Dam has an eel ladder on it where eels can go up the ladder to get above the Daniels Dam. Before the removal of Bloaty Dam, the Daniels Dam eel ladder was capturing around 28 eels per year. In 2022, it captured 36,594 eels. So they're getting up there now, um, which is really exciting to see. Um, they're finding more small eels across the whole area. They're just seeing evidence that the eels are using all of that new habitat that's been opened up, um, which is exciting to see. We've also been having the Maryland Geological Survey do some physical monitoring out on the river. They're looking at what's happening with sediment out there. So, They've done digital elevation models, which are bathymetry. Bathymetry is similar to like topography, if you see you know, the relief maps and stuff of areas, but this is for underwater. So they've been doing some underwater modeling of the depths and so forth within the former impoundment. Um, and I'm gonna share some of those results with you today. They've also been doing sediment sampling, mapping different sediment types and how they're moving throughout the river. I don't have time today to go through kind of the full suite of all of the information that's been collected, but again, happy to share more information with anyone who's interested. They've also been doing repeat photo stations to see 
visually how the river seems to be changing over time. Um, and then they've, they've been going and doing full topographic surveys of the river as well. So this is a, a heat map called an isopack. And this is the Bloaty Dam impoundment. So do I have a little light? Yes, okay. So the dam used to be here. This is the river. This is the like bridge, that's the pedestrian bridge upstream. That's where this stops. So this is the impoundment area that was behind the former dam. This image on the left is from August 2018 to August 2019, and it shows the amount of change. So the more change there is, the more red it is. So you can see in that time period, there was a significant amount of change. In fact, 99.75% of the sediment that moved out of the Bloody impoundment moved during that first, first year following removal. So if you were out on the river downstream, that first year is probably when you saw the downstream areas change the most as well. The middle image is from August 2019 to August 2021. So that's year two and year three following removal. You can see there's very little change in the impounded sediments in that time frame. Um, only 0.25% of the total sediment loss. So collectively, what this is illustrating is that most of the sediment from the impoundment moved out that first year, and it's been relatively stable since then. Uh, there's always gonna be little shifts. If we get a hurricane in this area, then we'll see a little bit more of like hard to access sediment move around up there. Um, but until that time, it's gonna kind of be like it is at this point. We're working on some publications of all of this information with these um, different uh, research practitioners. So the Maryland Biological Stream Survey are working on three publication manuscripts focused on each of their main areas, the migratory fish, the American eel, and then the residents and benthic macroinvertebrates, which I didn't get to talk to you about today, but there's a lot of information they've collected on those, those groups as well. Um, Matt Collins with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration has prepared a physical monitoring manuscript on the sediment movement that happened in that first year post removal where a lot was going on as I mentioned. That should come out in 2024 this year. That's an in progress publication. And the US Geological Survey is also working on another sediment paper that is sort of a stage analysis of the way, the sort of waves of sediment movement and so forth following the dam removal. That's a companion paper to, to one they did following the Simpkins dam removal a number of years ago now. So there's a lot of sort of publications that are gonna be coming out. American Rivers is also working on updating our Patapsco River pages. And we're hoping to share a lot of this information, all of the data that's been collected as part of this project because it's publicly funded is going to be publicly shared so we're, once all of that is posted publicly on, a lot of it will be on the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration data repository. We'll be sharing a page that has links to where all that is, these publications, the historical documentation, a lot of these different parts of the project. If people want to dig into them themselves and check it out. So, the next question that people are typically asking me is, what's happening with Daniel's Dam? Um, to move, remove or not remove? That's the big question, right? Um, American Rivers is working with the state um, to decide what to do with Daniel's Dam at this point. So the dam itself is, has, some, has some deficiencies. It needs repairs. Um, so the question that the state is grappling with is do they make repairs on the scale of millions of dollars or do they move forward with removal of the dam? Um, so we're hoping, we've, we've um, tried to get some money through the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration who's put a lot of funding in, into the Patapsco already um, to fund some of this feasibility work so that we can go out and talk to the community, folks like you all, um, folks at the Friends of Patapsco Valley State Park and actual, you know, folks that we encounter um, who are using the state park to see what people's thoughts are about this, to try to figure out is there a, a collective vision that we could all kind of agree upon that 
with this site um, with a dam not there? Is that something that people can envision? Could we change how this area is being used to benefit the public and what would that look like? Um, so we're hoping to get some funding to be able to start to have some of those conversations um, with, with anyone who's interested in talking about it. Um, the state hasn't formally said they're removing it um, at this point, um, but we're hopeful that that conversation can begin at some point later this year, hopefully. So the timeline on this dam could be years, um, the way that the other dams have kind of gone. Um, if it does end up being removed, it could be a while before that actually happens. Um, but we're starting to open the door for conversations about it at this point. And before I end, I just want to thank all of the people that have been involved with this project, there are tons of partners and funders. This is not a type of project that you can just do on your own. You really do need the community to come together around these projects to make them happen. Um, and a lot, a lot of folks have been involved in various different parts of this project throughout um, the duration of it um, and, and probably more uh, moving forward. So. I thank all of these folks. And at this point, I'm happy to take any questions that you all have. Yeah. Okay, I have a bunch of questions. I'm sort of nerd about some of this stuff. No, one. Is there like a map that shows how that sewer line was moved or where it was and where it is now? There is. Um, we have the design plans for the project mm -hmm. that I'm happy to share that can show you where that is. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have like a simplified map. What I can tell you is it used to run through the dam and around that right. location right. on the edge of the river you could see it. See you there. <laughs> and now it's under Grist Mill Trail. Okay. Roughly how far roughly was it moved away from the river? Huh. I don't know that distance no. off the top of my head. I'm not good with distances. Okay. So I'd have to go back and look. I don't I, I like I could throw a number out there and it may okay. not be right. Okay. So another question. Know. How effective was the fish ladder at the boating dam? It was not. Okay. Um, it, it wasn't passing Shad River Herring at all. American Eel, there were a couple of them that were getting up there, um, but it was really not. Fish ladders generally, most of the time, are not super effective unless they're designed for a very specific species in a specific location. Um, Good but, signage for how to get there. Right, <laughs> right. Um, it's hard to get the fish to understand where to go and how to use them, and so. It's, it's difficult, and especially it's difficult to get a wide variety of species. Okay. Two to more use questions. Quick questions. How far downstream from the floating end was the effect of all the silt that was built up behind it felt? Um, that's a good question. Um, it's made its way like down at this point to Baltimore Harbor. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the noticeable impact. Um, was, you know, down uh, some ways down the river until the river kind of flattens out downstream into more of a very wide floodplain area. Then a lot of it kind of went over bank down there um, in the bigger storms and things like that that have happened. Um, but it's largely moved out of the system at this point. Okay. And one last question. How far beyond the Daniels Dam does the river go before, to its origin? Not that far. I don't know the answer to the exact mileage. I mean, because it goes upstream to Liberty, right. which would be the next kind of barrier that the fish, if fish were going upstream, they would day encounter. Day. No, we don't have any. We don't have any visions of taking that Liberty up. Um, so, <laughs> as far as we're concerned, that's sort of where the road would end okay. for fish. But it doesn't go all that much farther past Liberty um, in the grand scheme of things. Okay. So, yeah. I think there might have been a question in the back. You answered it. So oh, okay. Daniels is the last one before you get to Liberty. Yeah, Daniels mm -hmm. is the last one before Liberty. Mm -hmm. If people want to stay on top of the the conversation about Daniels, what's the best way to stay up on information as that comes available? Sure. Um, we'll be having more conversations, so I'm sure that we'll coordinate probably with the Tapsco Heritage Greenway to have an actual sort of discussion session about Daniels. Um, at some point, probably later this year. Um, but people can email me. I'm going to be 
starting up a, a list of people who want to stay informed about what's happening um, and, and send out, you know, from time to time updates if there's things to report out to people. Um, we're hoping to kind of be very transparent with everyone about what's happening and when it's happening and when there's community meetings and, and so forth, which I expect for Daniels there will be a lot of different community meetings that we'll probably be having with different groups um, because the recreational interest at Daniels is so high. So, but you're welcome to reach out to me. Um, that's my email there, and I'm happy to, to kind of add you to my, my list I haven't quite started yet of, of new folks that are interested in that project. Yeah? The explosion of eel populations is very exciting. Are there um, animals that eat eels? What will that do to the mix of you know, the species, the ecology. There are some animals that eat eels, um, mostly when they're kind of smaller. Um, so when they first are kind of entering rivers and they're, they're glass eels and then, you know, they're very delicious um, to other fish that are bigger than them. Eventually when they get to be sort of the big females, they don't have as much predators, but birds eat them, other fish eat them, other like, you know, um, otters, things like that, that eat fish um, are also into eels. But eels are generalists, so they'll eat anything kind of. They eat a lot of different things. Um, but there are some things out there that do eat eels, so that should help some of the local like fish, birds, mammal populations um, having all those eels return upstream. They're also bringing nutrients from the ocean where they started up into the river. So that's one of the reasons that there tends to be a focus on migratory species is because they move nutrients from rivers to oceans and oceans to rivers and help some of that exchange, which is important for healthy river systems to have that nutrient kind of input into the system. Yeah. Two questions. When the Bloody Dam got removed, all that concrete, number one, like where did all that concrete get moved to? Like, you know, how did it get take, removed or taken care of? And then the other thing is you said the Bloody Dam was not functional anymore. Um, I don't know that much about the Daniels Dam. How, what, um, is it functional in, in some way? Like, sure. besides recreational or? Sure. Um, so the concrete from the dam most of it, some of it, I think, got incorporated. There's some, um, like, the, the um, park asked for some stabilization because of a, a tr the trail on not the grist mill but the other side. So some of it ended up on that bank over there for stabilizing that, that new trail that wasn't there before. Um, a lot of it got hauled off-site to, like, a, a regular disposal <coughs> site off-site. Um, as far as the Daniels Dam and uses of that dam go, um, it was also built for milling um, way back when. Um, and so it's obviously not being used for milling anymore. The, the building isn't there. And, um, I don't know a lot about the history of Daniels Dam yet. I expect that we'll be learning more. There's probably people in the room who can tell you what the history of Daniels Dam is. Um, but so it's not being used for the purpose that it was originally built for. Um, so the main purpose of it now is to create a recreational lake is, is really what it's, what it's uh, this purpose that it's serving at this point. Which is the case with a lot of mill dams just across kind of this area of the country. Um, they're not being used for milling anymore and so a lot of them are becoming deteriorated and people are having to decide do we want to fix this? Do we want to rebuild this? Is it important to us? Or is this something that we don't want to invest in? It doesn't make sense. And you know, we're interested in valuing the ecology of the river and restoring that instead. So it's a conversation. Yeah. What was the what was the total cost of the project to remove the dam and where where did the funding where did the different buckets of funding come from? Um, I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, but it's in the, in the general range of about $20 million. Um, a lot of that went towards the sewer line part of the project. The dam removal itself was a much smaller part of that, and then the site restoration was a part of that. There's also been, I think, $2 million spent on the monitoring effort for these three dams across the time horizon since 2009. 
Um, so there's been a significant investment in monitoring from the federal agencies, which is where the monitoring money comes from. A lot of the project funding also came from federal agencies. Um, some of it came from the Maryland State Highways um, and their mitigation program. Um, so that's where a part of it came from. We also had some private funders um, that were listed up on my previous slide um, and National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. There were a lot of different, like some smaller pots, but the biggest dollars came from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and the Maryland State Highways Administration. The follow-on on that would be, is there a sewer, is there a comparable sewer issue, sewer line issue at, at Daniels? There's not. So you would expect that project to be somewhat less? Yes, we would, we would expect it to be significantly less. However, I will caveat that, um, one of the issues with Daniels is that there is sediment up there. So at the Bloaty project and at the Simkin <coughs> Union projects, a passive sediment release was permitted. Uh, because the impacts downstream weren't expected to be significant. Up at Daniels, Daniels is above Ellicott City. As you all know, Ellicott City has flooding issues. Um, so the chances of us doing a passive sediment release, at least in a larger scale up there, is less. And if, we're move if that means if we don't release it, we have to move it somewhere, the cost of that could be significant. So there's no sewer line. I don't think the amount of sediment that would need to be moved up at Daniels would be of the volume that the cost would be equivalent to the sewer line, but it won't be a low-cost project, I don't think. Did we find any contaminants in the sediment upstream of Lodi, and have we looked upstream of Daniels? Uh, we did not find contaminants in the, in the um, upstream of Lodi, any different from the backgrounds everywhere else in the Patapsco. Um, we have done some preliminary sediment investigations up at Daniels, and so far there's not been any indication that there is any kind of contamination up there either, which is good, because that increases the cost of the project significantly if you have contaminated sediment you have to deal with. Um, that's a different ballgame altogether. Yeah? Did you uh, find out what happened to all the hydroelectric equipment at uh, Blake Dam? No. I assume it was removed much earlier. It was removed a very long time ago, and the Park Service doesn't know what happened to it, so I don't know. Yeah, it probably is not existing anymore. I don't think it's in a museum or anything like that, so yeah, unfortunately we don't know that. Yeah. I'm wondering about um, dam removal in general. Are there, are there lots of American rivers where, you know, projects of this scope are being done, or is, is this kind of a special case? Yes, so there have been more than 2,000 dams removed across the country. Um, the leader in dam removals is Pennsylvania. They've removed about 390 dams. Um, Maryland, I took the numbers out of the presentation that I had, I think has around 25 dams that have been removed in Maryland, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, so there are a lot more dams still out there. Um, and American Rivers has a goal to remove 30,000 dams by 2050 across the country. Um, so we're working hard to try to address particularly these structures that are deteriorating. I mean, dams aren't built to last forever, um, so there's a lot of these, especially mill dams out there that are breaking down that nobody really wants to deal with. Um, so we're trying to figure out how do we deal with those dams and restore the ecology of rivers throughout the country. but in this case, particularly in the Mid-Atlantic. Mm -hmm. So, we got a lot of yields, we're hoping to get more herring and yep. Are there other dams amongst that 2,000 or whatever you said, where there's specific success stories that you would want to share with us? So, and sometimes when you do this, you get something spectacular happening. Um, well, um, up on the Penobscot River, they've been in Maine, um, that's up in Maine, um, they, had a similar project where there was a couple of dams up there that they removed, they put in some bypass channels around another one, um, and they have seen great recovery of some of the migratory fish species up there in the Penobscot as a result of those projects. So I think that there's hope. Those projects happened before these, um, so I think that there's hope 
that we'll continue to see a good recovery um, start to happen in the Patapsco as well. Um, we also have seen recovery in Virginia rivers from a few dam removals, particularly of eel. Um, shad have been more difficult. I think generally shad restoration um, has been a little bit of a struggle in the mid-Atlantic everywhere. Um, but we're hoping that the more of these dams that we get out, the better um, the numbers will start to see of some of the shad and river hearing. Um, but it's a work in progress. There's some great examples of dam removals out on the west coast also. Um, I just literally came back um, on Sunday from visiting the Elwha River out in Washington. Um, and they're seeing some nice recovery of species and habitats out on the Elwha um, from the removal of two dams out there in a project that's significantly bigger than, than this one. The dams are 210 feet tall, we're talking, um, as opposed to Bloaty was like 30-ish feet tall. So the dams are a little bit bigger, but still, whether your dam is five feet tall or 200 feet tall to a fish, it's a wall. So um, it's just as important to be removing dams of, of the size that are on the Patapsco as it is to giant dams as well. Yeah. You had reference earlier that next year or this current year would be the last year of a certain set of monitoring, or maybe, and so I'm just wondering what that was. That sort of part of the initial project. There's like a 15 year period from 2009 to 24, and what's then the impact if, if this sort of monitoring is stopped? How do we how do we sort of assess the impact of the project long term? Sure. Um, so the funding for all of the monitoring sunsets this year. For, from the Fish and Wildlife Service and from NOAA. Um, so we've largely, so the sediment has largely moved. We've been able to document the, the sort of movement of the sediment. So continuing the sediment monitoring at this point doesn't really make a lot of sense unless you have some specific question, but not to the type of monitoring that we're doing um, currently. So a lot of the sediment has moved. The biology is going to continue to change. Um, my expectation is that as we get into the Daniels Dam project, there will end up being, you know, if that project moves forward, there'll end up being some monitoring associated with that. That'll pick up in some way. Um, in this case, NOAA has made this a tier two monitoring site, which means they've invested a whole lot of money, as I mentioned, in this site. Um, they're not likely to continue that level of significant investment um, moving forward. Um, because it's just a lot and there are a lot of places that need money for monitoring. Um, so we're going to continue to see some of the shifts, I think, um, with perhaps <coughs> hopefully the Shad River hearing will continue to recover. Um, and there's always an opportunity, either with the Daniels Dam or just independently, to try to do, say, five years from now to, to try to, to, you know, initiate a follow-up study um, to see how are the populations recovering five years from now or ten years from now or, or so forth. So. My guess is there will be more monitoring, it just won't be part of the sort of formal scope of the project, as it exists today. Any other questions? Thank you. Um, before we all go out and enjoy what's left of this beautiful evening, um, I just want to bring your attention to a few of our remaining TAPSCO Days events. Um, we do have our final lecture of our Tabasco Day celebration on Thursday, March 21st. Um, we're going to have Howard County archaeologist Kelly Palick come and talk about an ongoing project at St. Mary Cemetery in the Turk Valley neighborhood um, and expanding on why community participation and collaboration matter. Um, we do have an open house happening at the Nike Missile site in Woodstock. Um, even if our Eventbrite says it's sold out, please come. Uh, you don't need to register to attend. We're having issues with Eventbrite right now. Um, and finally, later this summer, we'll be having our third annual Charles L. Wagan Memorial Lecture. So I will be communicating more information about that in the coming months. So thank you again for coming out tonight. Um, if you have any more questions for Jesse, she'll be here for a little, a little longer. Um, and please help yourself to snacks before you go. It's that much less for me to pack up later. <laughs>